Tabasco is more than a mere condiment. It's an American artifact. The sauce was first made in 1868, and within a few years, it was being served in the White House. Since then, it's made its way to nearly every country in the world. It's one of America's most prolific exports, which is why we decided to take a closer look. And what we discovered is that every bottle of Tabasco has been made by the same family, a very private family, producing their famous sauce, known locally as Cajun ketchup, on their very own private island in the middle of Cajun country for five generations. The McElhenney clan has done it by adhering to 150 years of tradition in how they make their sauce and also what they say about it publicly, which is typically very little. Letting 60 Minutes come in with our cameras and our questions was a break from tradition. The story will continue in a moment. Avery Island is located in the bayous of Louisiana, west of New Orleans. Only two miles wide, the island has been owned by the McElhennies and their family for almost 200 years. This is where we take our pepper mash. It's 9 a.m. That means Tony Simmons, the fifth generation CEO, is heading to the warehouse for his daily taste test. Hello. Farmers all over the world grow the peppers, mash them, and ship it all back to Avery Island. You do this every morning that you're here? Every morning I'm here. I, I check these barrels if they're making mash. Where's this from, Clark? Columbia. That means every bottle of Tabasco in the world has his personal seal of approval. So I'm looking at the color, and that's why I've got an incandescent light. I want to look at the color. I want to look at the seed. And when I taste the mash, usually what I'm looking for is I get some salt out on the edges of my tongue. Uh -huh. And then about the time you think, well, this isn't that much of a big deal, <laughs> the heat comes late. Did you want to try it? Sure. I'm, I'm watching you first. Uh, how long I do this you? every morning. It's not so bad for me. Is that a good chunk? Yeah, that's good. That's you good. Just put it on the front of your tongue and then just let it sit there for a minute. And if you, you think ahead. Tabasco is hot, Take the raw the ingredients are ten times hotter. And then the, heat, the heat kicks in. <laughs> I have newfound respect. Peru. Tastes like candy. <laughs> Tastes like candy? Smells like money. Huh? Smells like money. <laughs> Are there secrets in here, though, that you don't want the rest of the world to know? Our formula is only red Tabasco mash, vinegar, and a little bit of salt. So I don't know how many secrets we could really have with a process that simple. It was Simmons's great-great-grandfather, Edmund McElhenney, who created the sauce shortly after the Civil War. He began selling his concoction in old cologne bottles in New Orleans, calling it Tabasco. There was no commercially sold hot sauce before Tabasco. Edmund invented the category. He is sort of the father of hot sauce. He's the father of hot sauce. That would make this the first family of hot sauce. <laughs> that sounds real good. <laughs> the first family of hot sauce turned Tabasco into one of the oldest and largest family-owned and operated businesses in the country. You're the fifth generation family member to run this business. Mm -hmm. How unlikely a story is this. Only 30% of companies outlive the founder or move to a second generation, and only 12% of companies actually make it to the third generation. So for us to be the fifth generation and still be doing this is a much smaller subset, I'm sure. From the beginning, the company has always been run by and for family members. So what I was going to spend some time doing and then uh, I'll take questions, uh, and we'll leave a lot of time for questions and answers, uh, is talk about our structure and our processes uh, and how we run our family business. First, uh, we're an S-Corp. Uh, we were a C-Corp, but in 2005, Congress changed the law that's because we couldn't fit under the number of shareholder regulation that S-Corps had at that time. And in 2005, Congress changed the law and said, for purposes of determining how many uh, shareholders an S corporation has, uh, you can count back six generations to a common ancestor and their spouses and count that as one shareholder. Only 6% of the businesses in the United States are formed as C corps. Now, admittedly, they're huge and they're a large part of our economy, but 94% of business in the United States is either uh, sole proprietorships, LLCs, S-Corps, 
uh, uh, partnerships of some sort. They're, they're not C Corps. So uh, S Corp tends to advocate for an awful lot of businesses that aren't necessarily S Corps, but a lot of times uh, it, they're, uh, they're pass-through entities, and we do a lot of work for pass-throughs. Uh, I have about 130, as I said, family shareholders who own the business along with me. Um, we have 10 members of our board of directors. Um, the president is the CEO, but we have an independent um, chairman who's non-executive um, to try to split the duties, and the chairman runs the board, and I run the company. Um, we think that's best practice, although there may be some uh, argument about that. Um, we currently, this slide is a little old, we actually have four family members now actively involved in the business. Our history is only to have between two and four family members involved in the business at any given time. It's a different model than an awful lot of family businesses, but it's worked for us. We invite three young family members to do what we call an associate board uh, seat, where we, we reach out and look at our young family cousins and uh, take the ones we think that have the potential to possibly be either involved in the business or involved at the board level, and we invite them to come into the board meetings and attend the board meetings and participate in the board meetings, uh, and it gives them an opportunity to see how their family business is run, and it gives us an opportunity to actually interview potential board candidates for the future. And <clears throat> that is the way um, uh, we select candidates. Communication. Um, my family is spread out all over the world now, and we have to try to communicate with them and try to keep them actively involved with uh, their family business and want them to continue to own their family business. So we do a quarterly shareholder letter, uh, which includes copies of our, our internal uh, newsletter. Uh, we have an annual shareholders meeting at Avery Island, and I usually get over 75% of my shareholders will attend uh, the annual meeting and come. It may have something to do with we serve a really nice lunch after it, but <laughs> with Bloody Marys. <laughs> um, I am always available to a shareholder uh, to discuss their family business with them, whatever it is on their mind. Um, we use a restricted where, uh, website for our shareholders because so many of my shareholders are younger and would prefer to get their information electronically, and it's worked pretty well, but we also restrict access. Uh, we monitor the IP addresses that come into it. And then I maintain an email uh, list that I can send a blast email to all of my shareholders, but no one gets the list just because I've sent them, uh, you know, an email. But I can reach out to my shareholders and, in, and communicate with them instantly. We do a family outreach program. Um, we invite 20 to 25 family members to come in for a three-day intensive Tabasco 101. And, um, we spend, they spend time with every one of our senior people, a significant amount of time. We also do it in conjunction with our quarterly board meeting, so all the board members are there, and the board members interact with them um, in, in, uh, at lunches and dinners, uh, and then they also interact with the officers and the officers' spouses during lunches and dinners, as well as individual sessions uh, with each department over what that department does, how they do it, and why. Board communication. Um, like, as I said, we have a very active board. Um, I have to prepare a business plan and present it to the board in October, and I am not allowed to implement any of the parts of that business plan uh, until the board uh, approves uh, the business plan going forward. My board receives detailed financial statements monthly and they get sales by region and product for the month, year to date, as well against prior year and plan. So they'll have three different columns on those financial statements. Here's what we said we were gonna do, here's what we did last year, and here's what our actual numbers are. So you can measure us against uh, both what we thought we could do and against what we did last year. Um, we do a detailed cash flow summary as well and then we do quarterly board meetings. Uh, we have four meetings a year, 
uh, and that seems to be about right for us. Uh, during those meetings, uh, I present a scorecard to the board that's based on the initiatives and objectives that the management team set in its business plan when we presented it in October. So we set out a set of goals and initiatives that we have for ourselves for uh, the coming year. And we use what I call a stoplight, uh, red, yellow, and green, to evaluate it. Red would be we're not achieving the goal. Yellow would be we're above last year, but we're not to the plan we are this year, or it's very close, but it's not there yet. And then green would be those things that uh, we are doing, we've done them, and, and we either are at or above uh, where we said we would be and also what we were last year. 